All right, class, let's talk about wind energy. This is one learning objective that is just focusing on wind. The vocab. Wind energy is pretty straightforward. You essentially just use the power of the wind to spin a turbine. That moving fluid, just like any of the other moving fluids that we've talked about, moves over a turbine, just like how we've talked about. And those turbines are hooked to generators, which generate electricity. Each one of these wind turbines is therefore going to have a generator up in this section of it. Um, which we'll see on the next slide. You typically won't see just one um, wind turbine out in a field. Instead, you're going to see many wind turbines that are all congregated into what we call a wind farm. This is more of a colloquial term, but you can probably use it on FRQ and get away with it. Um, and that's going to just generate more electricity and a little bit more um, you know, reliably. This is a renewable energy source. It is completely renewable. Um, there's plenty of energy in the atmosphere to continuously supply wind. However, it is not going to be a continuous supply in any given area because there are some days when the wind doesn't blow and that is therefore a variable energy resource. Now these turbine blades are designed to be really, really long so that they can capture the energy of even the slightest breeze. So there truly has to be like no wind that day for it not to produce any electricity. But in even a slight breeze, it's going to be generating some electricity. However, um, the turbines will be stopped. They'll, be, they'll put a mechanical brake on the turbine if the wind speeds are too high. If there's going to be a powerful storm that goes through with high winds, they will break these turbines, like literally put a brake on these turbines so that they don't spin. And if they were to spin at those high speeds, it would damage the gears and everything else that's inside. So um, they wouldn't want to do that. So it is a variable energy source. It is typically therefore um, going to be connected with a more consistent energy source or coupled with solar um, to be uh, more applicable for, for uh, large scale electricity production. So how it works is pretty simple. Um, the wind blows across these blades. These blades are angled so that they um, catch the wind and that that moving wind turns the entire structure. That spinning turbine is hooked to a gearbox, which just changes the gear ratios and everything to make it to where um, this generator spins uh, faster than it otherwise would be. And, you know, just like the gears on your bicycle or if you drive a, a, a vehicle with a manual transmission, um, very, very similar. That generator is going to generate electricity. The cables are going to send this all down um, and congregate together and send this all to the um, to the grid. You guys don't need to know how transformers work. We don't need to worry about AC versus DC electricity or anything like that. So essentially just the kinetic energy of the moving wind is going to be transferred into mechanical energy of the rotating blade um, and the spinning gearbox and then be uh, converted into electrical electrical energy at the generator. There are several types of turbines that we can um, distinguish based off of two basic categories. One is the axis of rotation. The first is a vertical axis, like what we see up here in the top right. You very rarely see these types of wind turbines, but what we mean by the axis of rotation um, being vertical is that this is the spinning axis and it is up and down, so it's vertical. And these blades will spin um, around this, this central axis. We can contrast that with a horizontal axis like what we see in both of the bottom pictures where the wind turbine stand goes up and then it goes over horizontally for a little bit and then that horizontal bit is the axis of rotation um, and the blades spin around it. And then we can also distinguish them between offshore and onshore wind farms. An onshore wind farm is going to be on land. An offshore wind farm is going to be off the shore, out in the ocean, or a large lake, or out in the water. There are definitely advantages of having your wind farm offshore. Um, it is a little bit more difficult to construct, but the construction costs um, are definitely recuperated from it being offshore because wind speed tends to be greater and the winds, to, winds tend to be more consistent. If you guys recall uh, the convection currents and, um, and uh, wind along coastlines when we talked about it first semester, during the day the wind will typically be blowing from the ocean and towards the land and then at night it's going to be blowing from the land out towards the ocean and you're going to even though you have a reversal of the direction of the wind, you're going to have very consistent wind pretty much all day, and that wind speed tends to be a little bit, um, a little bit higher. 
the size of those turbines offshore can be much larger because you don't have some of the constraints that you have on land um, and there's less community impact the only problem is is that you have to have the water to do it you have to be like in a coastal area so there is less locations available for offshore wind they will generate more electricity but there's less um, locations available okay Along with solar, wind is one of the fastest growing energy sources worldwide. The largest installations are going to be in the U.S. and the European Union, and the European Union especially uh, with offshore. But you see lots of um, wind turbines really anywhere that you go that is in a developed nation and is uh, relatively energy conscious. Even in developing nations, you're starting to see wind turbines all the time. I've seen wind turbines um, throughout Central and South America. I mean, in the in the countries that I've been to, at least, um, you see wind turbines popping up all over the place. In the U.S., um, we have 65,000 active turbines as of 2023, um, supplying 125 gigawatts of power, which is a little bit less than 10% of the U.S.'s total electricity. So it is a lot of electricity production and is continuing to grow, but is still dwarfed by the um, by the non-renewable energy resources that we use. I want to show a couple of graphs. Some of these you've seen um, in the solar PowerPoint. Um, but if the entire globe is going to transition to away from fossil fuels and primarily to renewables such as wind and solar um, for electricity, we need to know where they're applicable. So where is solar applicable? You can see on this graph. I'm not going to focus on it too much, um, but you can see where solar is applicable on the graph and where the major population centers are. And this one is what I want to focus on a little bit more, um, where wind is most applicable and where the major population centers are. So where you see the deepest colors of red, the darker colors of red is where it's most applicable. So you notice Northern Europe is um, great for wind and they um, are installing lots of wind capacity. Central United States, great for wind, and they're st installing a lot of wind um, turbines throughout the central United States. China is one of the most, is the most rapidly growing market for wind, and there's um, great potential, although maybe a little bit less so. It's a little bit more in the kind of yellow and orange than, um, than Europe or the central U.S., but I want you guys to see where the major population centers are and where wind is applicable. But if we were to completely transition our global economies to both wind and solar, if we combine those two graphs, there's not um, many places on the world that are both ideal for wind and ideal for solar. Most places are ideal for one or the other. Some places, neither. Some places, um, it's just not windy enough and the sun doesn't shine enough for either of them, and it's not near a population center. But if we look at where the population centers are and where we have combined wind and solar, it's not a great fit, especially if we look at this dotted line where um, over half of the world's population is. Now, if we're looking at the Philippines and Indonesia, they're great for geothermal and they're installing lots and lots and lots of geothermal. China is expanding on every single renewable energy resource. They have lots of hydroelectricity. They're the world leader in hydroelectricity. Um, they have some application of geothermal that is um, potential. But in terms of wind and solar, not super great. India, same thing. Um, you have a little bit of ideal wind, ideal solar, but not a lot, um, and especially not near your population centers. But your population centers tend to be along... Um, some of the major rivers and some of the major uh, coastlines. So maybe tidal or, um, or hydroelectric would be ideal. So we really have to think about where these energy resources are most suited and where the population center arts are. And for each population center, what makes sense? What is the most um, logical and cleanest uh, form of energy available? All right, so let's talk about um, the, the environmental impact of wind power. It is a completely renewable electricity source. So uh, if we get it right, it will last essentially forever. We can always just build more wind turbines. The land can be dual purpose. So in the bottom right, you see farmland that also has wind turbines. Um, I am sure that the farmer is getting paid or the is getting tax breaks or something, some type of positive incentive um, to have these wind turbines on his land. That might be one time, that might be continuous, but you see a dual use um, landscape down there. Most wind turbines that are onshore 
are going to be um, either in, they're going to be in more rural areas, and a lot of them are going to be in either pasture land or farmland. There is no emissions associated with the use, so it produces no gaseous emissions um, during use of this wind turbine. However, there is some emissions with construction, but if we compare um, the emissions with any of the other um, energy resources, it is extremely low. There is some, um, some materials that are needed for, for use, which we'll get to on another slide, but the environmental impacts are great because they are very, 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 very minimal. But let's talk about those um, environmental impacts. We need to um, install these, so that is going to disturb some land. It looks great once it's done and you like, um, you know, have that farmland that we saw in the last slide, but they don't show like the construction and um, the uh, the land use that has been changed um, during construction. So a lot of areas are going to be revegetated after you install your wind turbine, so it's not continuously going to look like a dirt pad on the bottom or the base of the turbine. They're going to be revegetated. So, but there is some um, habitat destruction. There can be some offshore habitat destruction, um, especially as you are drilling down concrete piles or however you're mounting them to the sea floor. That can um, release a lot of sediment into the waterways and that can have negative impacts on organisms, including clogging fish gills, making it more difficult to navigate um, and uh, smothering organisms as that sediment settles down. One of the big things that you'll always see with wind turbines is that the blades of the wind turbines um, can impact birds and it leads to both bird and bat mortality. Conservative estimates, um, it's around 100,000 bird deaths per year in the United States alone. So if we extrapolate that to the entire world, that is a lot of bird deaths, um, hundreds of thousands. The high estimates um, range anywhere from you know 500,000 plus. So they can be, um, they, there can be lots and lots and lots of bird deaths. One um, solution for that is, at least for the bird deaths, is um, to paint the one of these turbines red, or sorry, one of these blades red, so that birds can really see red really, really well. Um, it's one of the colors that they really hone in on. So if they see this red uh, circle kind of like spinning in the sky, or this one blade um, creating the circle as it spins, they can avoid that uh, wind turbine. A lot of wind turbines you will see, and even if you paid attention um, and go back to the previous slides, you'll see them just have the tips of them painted red. Um, that can be for birds as well, but that might also be for people, but um, typically it's uh, for, so that birds avoid them. Okay. Um, one solution for bat deaths is to install high-pitched sonar devices that the bats tend to avoid. Um, so that they don't, uh, you turn them on at night and the bats uh, avoid those turbines, okay? It may not be completely healthy for the bat, but it at least uh, prevents it from dying um, by hitting a wind turbine. So this is an example of the ones that are painted red. You see the three uh, red stripes or whatever on each of these blades, um, hopefully so that the birds will avoid them. And there is some material use. Uh, these turbines are designed to only last 20 to 25 years. Um, there's a lot of materials that go into these wind turbines, a lot of steel, a lot of copper, um, and some of that, a lot of that can be recycled. However, um, the blades are typically fiberglass and they can't be recycled as well. So people are coming up with innovative ways to reuse or repurpose or upcycle these blades. Um, we'll get into what this term really means on another day, but on the right you see three examples of that. A bridge that was created from old fiberglass turbine blades, a playground, and a bike shelter. Okay, There are other materials that are going to be used in the um, operation of these, such as lubricants that are typically going to be derived from fossil fuels, like um, derived from petroleum, um, in the gearboxes, etc. Many of the metals, though, um, can be recycled. It's just that the fiberglass blades can't be recycled. So it's better to repurpose them rather than send them to a landfill. In terms of human health impacts, um, it is very, very low, 0.04 deaths per terawatt hour, according to um, the source. However, there are some complaints of um, 
of people that live near turbines having compl um, complaining of persistent headaches. There is kind of like this low um, noise that is constantly being made from the uh, wind turbines as they rotate. And people have complained about that. Um, some wind turbines have actually been um, uninstalled because of that, because of uh, community uh, pushback. There's always the sense of NIMBY not in my backyard for wind turbines because people want to see like beautiful horizon and maybe not the beautiful horizon with wind turbines on it, although some people like that as well. Um, a lot of these wind turbines at night are going to have blinking lights on them um, so that aircraft avoid them, um, low flying aircraft avoid them. And residents have um, been upset for that in several areas, com complained about disrupted sleep patterns and stuff like that. But in terms of deaths, very, very, very low. Um, but in terms of um, some other human health impacts, uh, there is some local resentment and some local uh, complaints. All right, so we talked about how wind turbines work. So that is this first learning objective with its essential knowledge. And then the, um, the effects on the environment, primarily bird and bat deaths, but is a renewable clean source of energy um, and is uh, critical in our transition away from fossil fuels. All right, I hope you guys learned something and I'll see you all in class.